Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Saturday webinar for November 6, 2021. This is the fourth in our five-episode Fall 2021 series on the American presidency, and this time we focused on politics, precedent, and process, the presidency and the Supreme Court. We were joined, as usual, by our moderator, Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University, as well as Dr. Josh Dunn of the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, and Dr. Eric Sands of Berry College in Georgia. Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to another teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for documents uh, and the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I teach political science and history here at Ashland University, and I'm also director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program for undergraduates here as well. So this year for our Saturday webinars, we're drawing inspiration from two core documents uh, collections published by Ashbrook, both of which are available at TAH.org. And in the spring, we'll be discussing populists and progressives. Uh, but this fall, our theme is the presidency and context. And as I mentioned, we're drawing um, inspiration from our American presidency core documents collection. If you happen to be joining us for the first time, the point of these webinars is to bring together some thoughtful scholars and, and have a conversation about important questions. And I encourage all of you joining us today to participate in this conversation by submitting questions in the Q&A function, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. In the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today, the topic of our discussion is politics, precedent, and process, the presidency and the Supreme Court. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome uh, uh, today um, a very thoughtful scholar, a great teacher, and, and, and a friend, uh, Dr. Eric Sands of Barry College. And we may be joined uh, at some point by uh, Josh Dunn, Dr. Josh Dunn of the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. We'll see if he's able to, to connect, but always a pleasure, Eric. Um, I, I always yes. take away a lot of great things from, from listening to you talk about, um, about the courts especially, but I know you have a wide range of interests and, and teach a lot of different things, but. That's my ADD. Uh, that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take advantage of that today. <laughs> that's great. So thanks for joining us this morning, so. Um, so I, I'll just, you know, I just start with random observations about things and then, and then I'll leave it to you to put us back on, on course for, you know, something really interesting. Um, so it seems to me that the framers of the constitution, uh, created a kind of a, really an interesting relationship between the executive branch and the judicial branch. And you know, we know that the, that, that they intended, or they claimed to, in, uh, to be intending to set up a, a, an independent judiciary and an independent executive. Independent, I'm assuming meaning, or I think meaning independent from uh, sort of overbearing control by the legislature, right? Uh, but, there's a, but there is a kind of potential relationship between the executive branch and the, and the judiciary. The executive branch, as we know, nominates uh, justices to the Supreme Court and federal judges. Um, and so you might think that there's a kind of uh, natural I don't want to say friendship, but uh, I don't know, collegiality or something between those two branches. But um, in the uh, examples of cases that you've recommended today, Eric, we see that the courts have not always been that accommodating uh, or deferential, if you will, to actions taken by the executive branch. Um, so what I'm hoping we'll do today is talk a little bit about, you know, um, to what extent do we find cooperation between the executive and judicial branches? and and then highlight some of the major points at which the courts have pushed back against executive power and maybe some of the reasons why. So, um, so I'll just start with a broad question. Um, uh, do, do you, uh, having studied this uh, you know, very extensively, do you find that the courts are more willing usually to sort of defer or cooperate with the executive branch in, in, in some instances or has there been more pushback? Maybe that's a too maybe that's too broad and silly of a question, but no, what's, what's your take on it? So yeah, 
I, I think you have to kind of split it up a little bit um, into presidents in their foreign policy dimension and presidents in their domestic policy dimension. Um, in foreign policy, the courts tend to be far more deferential uh, towards presidents, especially in times of conflict. Um, you know, you're, you're going to find, you know, the courts are, I mean, think of Korematsu, you know, the, the Japanese internment case. Um, I mean, this is an extraordinary thing that the courts allowed FDR to do. Um, I mean, you cannot imagine the court allowing this to happen in a time of peace. Uh, but during a time of war, you know, the courts seem to recognize that there needs to be a lot of discretion on the part of the executive and that courts are just not in a good position to make decisions about what is and is not necessary in the prosecution of war. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's where you see the greatest amount of deference, although as you get into, you know, the war on terror, um, you know, Russell v. Bush and Hamdi v. Bush and, uh, you know, those cases and stuff, you see the court starting to assert itself um, when it comes to prisoner detentions and enemy combatants and those sorts of things. So they are, you know, inserting themselves a bit uh, into the process of how to deal with those things. But yeah, in general, I, th I think you see an attitude of deference to the executive overall, whereas on the domestic side, I think the court sees a more you know, substantial role for itself in deciding what's okay, what's not okay. Um, you know, can presidents have a line item veto? Can presidents have civil suits brought against them while they're in office? You know, can you do those sorts of things? Um, and uh, they're more willing to uh, assert their authority um, and say, well, here are the boundaries. Here's what we're going to recognize as acceptable and not acceptable. Uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, but that's how I'd sort of divide up, um, you know, the, 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 the court's attitude towards the executive branch is, is one of deference in foreign affairs and uh, a largely deference in foreign affairs. Um, and then a more measured uh, respect, but uh, a willingness to set boundaries uh, in domestic affairs. That's very, that's very fascinating. I had not thought of it that way. And uh, especially in, in light of, you know, like when it comes to foreign policy, um, uh, you know, decisions, a, a lot of times in foreign policy, it requires a large degree of discretion and speed and, uh, or what is, how did Hamilton call it? Energy on the part Energy, of the president, yeah. right? And, but whereas domestically, when it comes to policy making and lawmaking, that can take a little bit more time and it can be a lot more sort of procedural in a sort of normal way. So that, that sort of makes sense as to why the courts would be. Um, it really does make sense why they'd be more deferential uh, because they're just not in a position to make those kinds of foreign policy decisions. So, yeah, it's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. I, I'm, I'm, uh, by the way, I just noticed Dr. Dunn is here. Josh is, is here. Good morning, Josh. Yeah, I apologize for my lateness. We've had Wi-Fi problems. I couldn't get on the web. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> So I'm here now, though. It's been something of a tech disaster at my house this morning. So my apologies uh, for that. Yeah. Not at all. These things happen. We're just happy you can make it, uh, given all that's going on. So, so Eric, Eric was just starting us off with some really, really interesting thoughts about, you know, sort of how do we start to think about um, the relationship between the executive and the judicial branches, and and Eric was laying out some thoughts on on uh, in what sort of ways the the courts tend to be a little more deferential towards, uh, you know, actions of of the executive branch and and what sorts of things they tend to push back. Uh, or are more willing to sort of step in and push back under certain circumstances. So I don't right. know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I mean, the, you know, obviously foreign affairs is the place where the courts uh, typically will uh, show some deference um, to, to presidents. Uh, however, you know, the war on terror, it has been different. Uh, you've seen the courts being less willing to do that. And I think it does go to the nature of the war on terror that the war on terror seems to be something that um, at least back when they were making some of these decisions involving habeas corpus for people at uh, Gitmo, um, that it seemed to be uh, a, a war without end. Uh, and since there was no de definite uh, ending point, um, their general policy of letting the political branches and particularly the presidency have a lot of latitude was one that was taxed, at least for some of them. 
And so they were willing to make decisions that, for instance, I don't think you would have ever imagined them making during a conflict like World War II. Um, so I do think, and, and I think one of the questions we're going to have to ask is whether or not this is going to continue. Um, was this just kind of a one-off uh, um, experience for the court where they were willing to, uh, to establish more boundaries um, in, in, in foreign policy uh, just because of, uh, of the nature of the war on terror? Or is it going to continue um, as we go forward in areas that uh, traditionally would not be um, you know, the, kind, the, the, the kinds of areas that the Supreme Court would want to actually try to esta uh, establish policy and simply because they don't think they know what they're doing. Right? That's part of, I think that's part of the problem for the Supreme Court is that, they, that they've always thought um, that they don't have the, the knowledge or the capacity uh, to actually establish um, policies in these areas. So um, yeah, I think that's I, I think that's one of the questions we're going to see, and some of it, of course, just depends on world events, right? I mean, are there going to be conflicts that where, where these where these kinds of questions are going to rise? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I was just looking at the at the suggested readings for today that you guys came up with, and um, so the prize cases during that's during war, eighteen sixty three, uh, ex parte Milligan is after the end of the Civil War, but. Maybe if we talk when we get into some of these cases, we could maybe contrast that to the course uh, reasoning in ex parte uh, Merriman, which takes place during the Civil War. And then you've got the Curtis Wright case in 36. But then Korematsu and Youngstown Sheet are both related to wartime circumstances, right? So some, it, it's just an interesting range of cases here. Um, so what, we, can, uh, we can take this any number of ways. Um, we could get into the cases if you think that's the best way to sort of lay out some of these ideas with, with regard to the relationship between the two branches. Uh, I will point out that Heath has submitted a question. I think Heath has been waiting for three webinars to, for us to address this question. So, <laughs> so did President Lincoln ask Congress to declare war and did they declare war? Um, and part of the reason I, I wanted to bring that up is because we do have the you know, two cases involving President Lincoln, right, with the prize cases and the um, um, uh, Milligan case. Uh, and then Joe asks, uh, points out that the Gitmo habeas corpus cases also implicated the extent of the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, and the court always has jurisdiction to determine it, has jurisdiction to determine its own jurisdiction. So, so I don't know if you want to address that that uh, argument of Joe's, or if you'd rather just jump into the cases. You guys can take it any direction you want, and I'll just shut up and listen <laughs> and learn. Well, uh, to that first question about Lincoln, uh, Lincoln addressed Congress in special session, and there's a document we assign for tons of classes um, with with Lincoln essentially laying out everything he has done to Congress uh, to prosecute uh, the defense of the Union um, and the war effort up to that point. And, you know, the subtext of it is, you tell me whether you approve of this or not. Um, you know, I've, I'm, I've been doing what I think is right. I'm doing what I think is necessary to preserve the Union. If you disagree with me, you know, pass legislation, pass resolutions, you know, tell me that I shouldn't be doing this and I'll stop. Uh, Congress obviously agreed with what he was doing. Uh, they rubber stamped uh, the actions that he had taken and in the process ended up declaring war. Um, it's only one of five times Congress has declared war in American history. Um, so the others are the uh, War of 1812, uh, Mexican-American War, and then World Wars I and II. Uh, so all the other conflicts we've been involved in been without a declaration of war by Congress. Um, so uh, another feature of executive power <laughs> that we could say something about, because um, you know, by some estimates, we've been engaged in somewhere in the neighborhood of 110 armed conflicts in American history, and only five have a declaration of war associated with them. You know, that's perhaps not what the founders had in mind <laughs> when they were establishing the war power. Um, and, and I will say, uh, you know, a number of those conflicts have looked an awful lot like wars. Um, you know, some of them have been relatively minor, but um, some of them have been quite substantial. Uh, but yes, Congress does end up declaring war. Uh, and um, 
uh, you know, there's a, a formal declaration that Lincoln then is operating under uh, once Congress approves that. Yeah, so I, I think the issue with Congress declaring war, and it's gotten, you could say, worse, uh, depending on your point of view, since since World War II. I mean, that's when we've seen the most significant conflicts that uh, have been wars, but there's been no official declar declaration of war, is that Congress uh, suffers from collective action problems. And so uh, that means that the Congress members uh, find it difficult to act in the interest of Congress. That is the the interest of individual members don't necessarily line up with the interest of the institution. So it makes sense for them to uh, outsource the uh, decision over war uh, to the president. Uh, because if, if we go to war and it goes swimmingly, <laughs> um, yeah, that is that uh, we, it's successful, the American people end up favoring uh, what's happened. Congress gets very little credit um, and members of Congress get very little credit. Uh, but if they declare war and it doesn't go well, uh, then that can be used against them, right? So if we if they voted for it, for instance, and uh, that, you know people can challenge them in the next election and saying it it, it it implicates their judgment, and so I think for members of Congress uh, they've just abandoned, at least in the uh, over their power to declare war, uh, abandon any. Um, any attempt to try and protect their institutional power or protect the interests of the institution. Yeah, and I think in the last webinar, I think we talked about this a little bit as well. So, and the war, by the way, Congress seems to think that the war powers resolution is the new mechanism by which they can control executive actions in war. So there's no longer a need, right, for them to say, you know, we're the gatekeepers with regard to actual declarations of war. And we got into some of the nuances of whether or not that's actually true, right? Whether or not right, right. Congress actually has the power to control these things through the war powers resolution. Right, right. And uh, talk about the you know possible constitutional uh, problems with that with that act, but but you know uh, so and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's, that's the part that's that's gotten kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's it's basically institutionalizing what Josh just said. I mean, you know, deferring to the president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the decision right. over war making. Um, you know, it's 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 Congress formally saying, you know, we're not capable of making decisions about going to war. You know, we're going to give that decision entirely to the president. But in terms of checking the president, I mean, the likelihood that the president is going to deploy troops uh, and engage in armed conflict and Congress is going to have the wherewithal after 60 days to say, all right, we don't think this is a good idea and we're going to defund it. Right. I mean, the American <laughs> people would massacre them um, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to defund the troops. Um, it's It's just not going to happen. So this is this isn't even the semblance of an actual check on the on executive war making. And I, I don't know of a single case when they have followed through on that and defend. And, no, you know, they defend threatened them. to during the first Gulf War. Right. Um, they you know they postured, but they didn't actually follow yeah. through on it. That's really interesting. So Eric, you brought up the uh, you brought up Lincoln's message to Congress in special session, which is delivered, I, I don't think accidentally on July 4th, 1861, right? Um, maybe it is, but I, you know, I like to think that he, he called them into session on that day on purpose. Um, and in that speech, uh, in that address to Congress, as you were saying, he's laying out the things that he did. And he, he, um, he defends four particular things that he did as executive when Congress was out of session. Uh, he called the militia into service and he, and he uh, authorized the blockade of Southern ports. And Lincoln describes those actions as, as strictly legal, right? Because he's acting under the authority, I think, of legislative acts that have, again, sort of delegated uh, power to the executive to make those decisions in, in their absence or when they're not in session. And then uh, Lincoln ra actually raised an army, calls for volunteers. And, and on that point, Lincoln says, um, uh, nothing in this regard, nothing was done beyond the constitutional competency of Congress, <laughs> which if I'm, again, I, I just taught this a couple of weeks ago, so it's still sort of fresh in my mind, which if you read in a certain way, might be Lincoln saying, maybe this is a little constitutionally sketchy, but, but then on the habeas, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, which is the thing that really a lot of people are going after Lincoln for, right? He authorized the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Lincoln seems to sort of brush that off. And yet that, that becomes the subject of a great controversy that does in fact make its way to the courts. Um, first in the, um, in the ex parte Milligan case, and then we've got the 
ex parte Merriman case here uh, as suggested reading. So maybe maybe that's a good place for us to sort of dive into the text a little bit or the cases. Can you guys want to walk us through the significance of this case? I'm not sure if, if one or both of you recommended it, but uh, what's the what what's going on with this case? Why is it so significant? So which one? Uh, Milligan. I was, Milligan, I, was trying to, yeah. I was trying to segue from what we were talking right, about. Okay, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, or Mer which one? Wait a minute. Sorry, I've got him confused in my mind now. I apologize. Which one comes after the Civil War? Milligan. 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 Yeah, Sorry. Milligan, yeah, I was. Right. I was so that's a, right. So so that's uh, that's an example of the court. And so the question there was whether or not someone could be tried in a military tribunal, uh, even if uh, civilian courts were still, civil courts were still, were, were still functioning. Uh, and the, uh, the Supreme Court said no, um, but the date is significant, right? It is decided after the Civil War. That's one of those cases where if, if the court were, say, deciding this in 1863, I'm not certain that you get the same outcome. Uh, you have this very um, strong language about how the Constitution is a document both for war and peace. And so civil liberties apply re regardless whether it's a time of war or peace. But it's, it's easier to say that um, after the Civil War, after the conflict is, is already over. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an important case, but I think the, the, the dates uh, do matter for it. The, the timing matters for that case. Yeah, I, I completely, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, it, it's there's, I, I really can't see, um, you know, the court del delivering that opinion uh, while the war is still going on. Uh, and of course, the the five members that make up the majority in the prize cases are the same five members that make up the majority in the Milligan case. Um, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what's changed? Well, there's not a war going on anymore. Um, that that certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, to what you said, Chris, I I think Lincoln didn't see a, a lot um, in the who suspends habeas corpus as being all that important. Um, I, I think his view was the Constitution says that the writ can be suspended. That's that's what matters. So the fact that it shows up in Article One is of no real importance. You know, it's it's if it's if the public safety requires it, and if it's a case of invasion or or insurrection. Well, we've got those conditions met. Um, so the fact Congress isn't in session, you know, necessitates the uh, suspension uh, taking place. The executive can step in in those instances and suspend it. Um, and you know, Lincoln stands by that uh, throughout the war. Now. That being said, I have not met a legal scholar yet who agrees with Lincoln on this. <laughs> um, and the Supreme Court has never had the opportunity to rule on this, um, you know, uh, authoritatively, because, you know, it's never come up again uh, in that context. Um, but yeah, every legal scholar I've ever talked to has said, no, Lincoln's wrong on this. Um, it's only Congress that can suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact is Lincoln did it and that does set a precedent. Um, so, you know, it at least holds the door open that such a thing could be done by a president again, subject to legal challenge and the court's review. So in, in the, uh, in the Merriman and Milligan cases, I know the cases are not directly about whether or not the president can constitutionally you know, authorize the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, but that doesn't stop the, like uh, the the courts from touching on it, right? Sort of tangentially in their opinion. That's that's always my take on at least the Milligan case, right? Maybe it's orbit a dicta or whatever. You know, it's not directly related, but they they want to throw something in there, some thoughts in in there on whether the president can do this or not. So, um, no, well, Merriman is directly on point. I mean, that's, that's oh, that's exactly right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what Tony is writing about in Merriman is whether or not the presidents can suspend habeas corpus. And yeah, I, I will admit, you know, for all of Tony's shortcomings, he puts together a pretty compelling case for why this is not an executive power um, and why the executive shouldn't be doing this. Um, but he's writing as a circuit court judge. This isn't a Supreme Court opinion. And so Lincoln just ignores it, <laughs> even though that's Tony right. Sends, 
Tani sends a copy of the opinion to the White House. Um, <laughs> so, wow. so that, you know, Link, Lincoln sees it and, and he can uh, see that Tawny thinks what he's doing is wrong. But um, yeah, I mean, Lincoln just ignores the thing uh, and it never makes its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, you know, obviously it, that would have been interesting about what Lincoln would have done in that instance if the Supreme Court had ruled against him. Um, on suspension of habeas corpus, but Congress does ride to the rescue once again and passes its own suspension act. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not really in doubt at that point um, that the writ is suspended. I had totally forgotten that, that the, the, the Tawny's writing. That's really fascinating. So, um, Josh, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. If you were gonna... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, so he, I think we've kind of addressed this, right? Heath then asked, why did the court flip-flop between the Fries and the Milligan cases? And you've already mentioned the circumstances have changed, right? To a certain extent, I think, right? Yeah, I, um, I think that the but, time, I, yeah, that's just, the court has just been hesitant to um, uh, strike down presidential action uh, in the middle of a conflict, um, at least right. up until you get to the, uh, to the war on terror. You could perhaps say, um, New York Times versus United States might be an example uh, of this, but it's 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 still a little bit it's still a little bit different. Um, but that's generally the posture of the court um, that it doesn't want to sec second guess uh, the military actions uh, or what presidents regard as military militarily ne necessary actions in the middle of the conflict. Um, it's just a very it's a very difficult thing for them if they were to do it and it were were to uh, as a result um, it would compromise the war effort. It would be uh, catastrophic for the court, right? And to the extent that people associate, if, they, if the court says, well, you can't do this because of the Constitution, then there's a fear that people would lose their, their respect for the Constitution as well. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, uh, so when looking at the prize cases and, and the Milligan case, ex parte Milligan, um, what do you guys just, you know, for those of us joining us, what do you think they ought to take away from those cases with regard to um, what the court says executive, what the, what, how the court's decisions affect our understanding of executive power, and maybe even the extent to which the decisions of the court on those issues have actually sort of held up. Have they, do we still, uh, do, their, do their opinions on those questions still matter? Or have they been ignored, <laughs> overturned? I don't know. Any thoughts on any of those things? So I mean, they're still cited. <laughs> you, you, the court, you know, Supreme Court will, yeah. will still cite them. But again, I think it. Uh, you jump ahead to Korematsu. It's clear that Milligan didn't carry the day in Korematsu. Right? Oh, the, how? How so? Can you explain that? I don't understand that. <laughs> right. So yeah. So Milligan says that the Constitution applies equally in times of wars and, and in times of peace, and that clearly wasn't what the court said in Korematsu. <laughs> that in uh, that's uh, um, what reasonably necessary military precautions can be taken, or however however the majority put it, um, can be taken, and that therefore civil liberties. It's obvious that during peacetime, this would be a, a gross violation of Fred Korematsu's civil liberties. All right. Uh, so if Milligan were to apply, if they'd applied Milligan and Korematsu, they would have said, "Look, can you do it in peacetime?" No. Well, just because it happens to be war uh, means that doesn't mean that you can do it now. Um, so that's what I again. It's 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 World War II. They're just willing to give the president far more latitude, rightly or wrongly. Um, but they weren't. At least a majority was not willing to second guess um, the the president on it. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is that I think it helps us also appreciate that the court is a political institution. Um, there's, I think, that perception that these justices rule only on the law and they ignore everything else. Well, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think, you know, the court is keenly aware of circumstances. They're keenly aware of what's going on in the country. Uh, they're keenly aware of what's happening politically. Um, and at times they have to take those things into consideration uh, when making their decisions. Um, you can look at uh, the period of time after the Civil War, 1865 to 1873, 
The court is nearly silent all the way through military reconstruction. Right? Well, why? Well, because Congress is trying to impeach the president. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Congress, Congress is going crazy. <laughs> and they, they almost remove him. Um, you know, he's saved by a single vote in the Senate. Um, Congress is not, you know, very amenable to anybody who is trying to stand in the way of assertion of congressional power. Um, and so the court does, I think, the only thing it can do, it lays low. Right? It doesn't put its head up. It doesn't give them a target um, until things have calmed down and, you know, the passions have uh, essentially, uh, you know, waned a bit um, in Congress. And then the court asserts itself again in the slaughterhouse cases um, and, and significantly limits the 14th Amendment in the process. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, court does the same thing after, you know, FDR's court packing plan. You know, all of a sudden, one justice is switching his vote and FDR's winning cases. I mean, it, it, it does have its pulse on what's going on uh, around it. Context does matter uh, for a lot of these cases. Um, and so I don't think it's a surprise that we would say the court is taking context into consideration in a case like the prize cases or in Milligan, um, that it does carry a difference to it based on whether you know the war is actually going on or not. So there's a question about uh, the political nature of the court uh, that just that just popped up. Uh, well, I think they have to say that. <laughs> they have to say that they aren't political. Their institutional power hinges on at least the perception uh, that they are trying to. Um, apolitically divine the meaning of the Constitution. And that if the people thought that they weren't doing that, uh, that uh, there would be far less willingness uh, on the part of the public and the part of the president and Congress to follow their, their rulings. Um, so I do think just a, an enormous amount of their institutional powers hinges on this perception. And so if you just had the justices just come out and say, Oh yeah, we're political, just like the other branches. <laughs> that would be uh, catastrophic right? um, uh, for the uh, uh, for the court. You you can go back to Federal Seventy Eight, which I think I think Hamilton overstates things uh, in Fed Federal uh, Seventy Eight, uh, saying that the court's the, the the least dangerous branch because it doesn't have the power of the sword of the purse, pointing to the fact fact that really it that that what their power will hinge on is the willingness of people to accept the legitimacy of their reasoning. And if the public just comes to regard it as just political all the way down, then, hey, we already have some political branches. <laughs> why, are we, why are we letting you folks who are life tenured and, and unelected uh, d decide political questions for us? Yeah, that's a great clarification. I can't think of a time, well, I mean, I, that's not the right way to put it. I mean, but go all the way back to the early Republic. I mean, was John Marshall political? <laughs> I, I think he was, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, or at least, or at least the Republicans thought he was. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they've always been, you know, inclined toward one political view or the other. Um, so I think that was a great, great follow up to, to or quite a response to Julie's point, Eric. I think on your point, you were, I thought when you were using the term political, you meant like they're aware of sort of political circumstances in general. That is, they don't just make decisions in a kind of, uh, you know, a, in a, a vacuum, yeah. sterilized back, <laughs> yeah, to a laboratory or something, right? So. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I I think you could go both ways on that. Um, mm -hmm. In in talking about them as political, as in as in partisan, uh, I think there's no question there are ways uh, you can view cases and decisions as as following a particular outlook on judicial interpretation. I mean, again, judicial interpretation is different from partisanship. Um, it's, it's not that you've got Republicans and Democrats on the court, but you have different interpretations of, of the way that the law uh, should be construed and you know, how we should interpret things that I, I think uh, you can clearly see um, from the way uh, they write and, and the opinions that they hold. Yeah. And if you're in, there's a, there's a good book that captures some of the, again, I, it's not politic, perhaps political in the way we normally think about political, but the kind of political negotiating that's gone on on the court. And there might be less of this today than there used to be, but I'm certain it still exists. But the, 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 the book is called The Brethren uh, and is written by Bob Woodward, 
and I can never remember his co-author, um, but it covers about eight years of the court's history. And at the time it was considered tabloid trash about the court because it actually revealed some of the internal deliberations that look, or not, look awfully political. Let's just put it that way. And the only thing that's happened since the book has come out is that uh, most of the really controversial findings um, uh, uh, that, or things that Bob Woodward and his co-authors said have been confirmed. Um, as more of the justices' files have become available, people have actually gone back and looked to say, all right, well, there's this infamous story in the Brethren. Uh, let's see if there's any uh, supporting uh, documentation from Justice Blackman's files, for instance. And it turns out that there's a lot there um, su supporting it. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so I'm backtracking a little bit here, but maybe this is another follow-up from Heath. Uh, we, when we were talking about executive or uh, court decisions uh, uh, during times of war. So just a, a follow-up. Uh, Heath asks, is part of the reason that the courts side with the executive during war uh, is that they know if they do not that their rulings will just be ignored until after the war. So that raises a question in my mind, have there been times when presidents have ignored decisions of the court? During war. Well, well yeah, he's asking I mean, during war, but I... Yeah. I my mind immediately goes to, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's ignoring a decision of the court, but you know, I think of Andrew Jackson and the National Bank and, mm -hmm. you know. Well, Lincoln and Dred thing, Scott, right? I, you, you could say that Lincoln ignored Dred Scott because of course the Dred Scott decision says that it's uh, freed slaves. So, uh, so the blacks could never be citizens. Uh, but during, this, during the Civil War, you know, Lincoln, uh, gives passports um, to uh, uh, to free blacks, which you only give to citizens. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so what Link Lincoln's position was that the Supreme Court uh, controls the disposition of that particular case, but it doesn't necessarily control other institutions involving the similar questions or even the same question in other kinds, in other kinds of cases. So he's like, I don't think I have the authority to go and actually um, free uh, Dred Scott, uh, but I don't have to accept the court's reasoning about this broader question about citizenship. Yeah, he, al he also has this, uh, in one of his speeches in reply to Dred Scott, he, he creates an interesting view on the establishment of precedent. Um, and, you know, he recognizes that Supreme Court cases do establish precedent, but he sort of tries to examine under what conditions they establish precedent. And he says there's kind of two different instances. So he says, you know, if you've got a unanimous decision by the court that's in accordance with legal expectation and there's no hint of partisanship and there's no hint of bias um, in the opinion itself, okay, you could consider it precedent. But if you don't have those conditions in place, then a judicial issue needs to come to the court a number of times before it becomes precedent. Um, and I, I know I always had my students read this in con law and ask them, you know, what they think of this. And I'm always surprised how many of them think it's actually a good idea uh, that they, they agree with Lincoln, that, you know, you shouldn't have one five, four decision establish precedent for the entire country. Uh, that, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you ought to give it you know, a period of time, five or six years, have the issue brought up to the court several times, have a repeated series of rulings before we say absolutely, yes, okay, that is now precedence, that is now the, <laughs> the law of the land. Um, so again, I, I don't know, I don't know how serious Lincoln was about this. I don't know that he really thought he was going to get a lot of people to sign on <laughs> to his idea. Um, but uh, it was another way of, of undermining Dred Scott um, and limiting the effects of, of that decision. Well, he basically repeated the same position in his first inaugural address. Uh, he said, look, if we just submit all questions, constitutional questions uh, to the Supreme Court, um, we will have ceased to be self-governing and just, you know, submitted, you know, submitted ourselves to, uh, you know, or uh, put us in the hands of that imminent tribunal or something like. That. So he was, I think he was, he was serious about this, um, and uh, yeah. So the phrase he uses, "nothing's fully settled unless it re uh, has those 
uh, criteria that, that Eric mentioned. And if you go through Supreme Court history, there's almost nothing that's fully settled. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the <laughs> implication, right? There's maybe yeah. maybe Brown versus Board of Education. Right? That might be mm -hmm. um, the, the, the one uh, precedent that would count as a fully settled one. Um, but other than that, it's tough. To, it's tough to identify one that actually link. You, you could see Lincoln saying, yep, um, that's it. The issue is, has been resolved. We need to need to move on. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and again, that you know that that description of precedent or the criteria for precedent from Lincoln, it does get a lot of press time, in you know, in classes and things like that. But the court, I don't think, has ever acknowledged that that's <laughs> that's a requirement, right? I mean, because, I mean, the court will will uh, the, the court will um, the courts if they want to in a particular case say that this one decision before this has settled a precedent or made a precedent, you know, in light of stare decisis, they'll, they'll use it. In fact, the court, you guys know this. I think I learned this from you guys um, in a previous webinar. The courts will even say, uh, uh, sort of um, claim that a precedent has been established in a, in a dissenting opinion, right? <laughs> from time to time. So there is this precedent that we have to follow or something like this. They don't use that language necessarily. Uh, you know, those like, like the, what's the fame, there's the famous uh, dissent from Louis Brandeis having to do with uh, the right to privacy, right? That's a dissenting opinion. But then by the 1950s, the court is saying, that, you know, they're looking back to this as establishing a kind of, you know, precedent for how we think about uh, searches and seizures. So anyway, yeah. So yeah, the courts are never going to, yeah, the courts are going to do what they want, it seems to me. But, you know, anyway. So we've got a number of other great questions coming in based on what you're both saying. So uh, Joe points out Lincoln's view as you were just describing it, both of you, sounds close to Jackson's, again, bank veto message. There's kind of an irony in that, right? Because it's not exactly the same argument Jackson was making, but, but what they have in common is they're both arguing that just because the court says an issue has been fully settled, it doesn't mean the issue has been fully settled, right? I think that's the similarity or? Right, I think Jackson, I think Lincoln ends up being at least slightly more deferential to the Supreme Court than Jackson. Um, <laughs> but in practice, it could look, end up looking the same. Interesting. Yeah, and I know Jack, uh, Lincoln takes some heat for his uh, Dred Scott speech, right? He takes some heat from uh, Stephen Douglas for sort of resisting the decisions of the Supreme Court. And I know in the, the debates, uh, the um, uh, the Senate debates, Lincoln Douglas debates in, in 58, Lincoln points out to Douglas, well, aren't you a great admirer of Stephen Douglas? Don't you claim his, him as your great, uh, <laughs> you know, ideal of a statesman? So there's an interesting, you know, use of the courts and their, and their, and the court's use of, of precedent here uh, for political purposes. But, um, so Casey also asked, if you guys don't mind taking another question, if the president can ignore the court until the end of a conflict, so circling back again, just a little bit here. If the president can ignore the court until the end of a conflict and the Congress can't limit his war powers due to the political ramifications, are there any real, now I gotta scroll down. Any, are there any real limits on the president's war powers? <laughs> That's an easy question for a Saturday morning. Josh, you're, you, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a, and yeah, that's still working. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I do think, I, I mean, I, I think the natural place to limit the president's war powers, it, it's with Congress. It, it, the court is not, not the best place. Um, and I do have to, I have to mention Justice Jackson's um, dissenting opinion in Korematsu, because I think this really does get, and I've talked about some of his arguments in that, but it's, he really gets to the core of the problem for the court being the institution limiting the, the, the president's power. So what, what Justice Jackson says, he dissents, and his, his position is, look, this is clearly a violation of Korematsu's um, civil liberties, um, but the court should simply avoid these kinds of questions during the conflict, uh, because the court is in a no-win situation. It's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for the court. So they should just fabricate some reason for not deciding it, claim that the issue isn't ripe yet, <laughs> um, whatever. They could invent lots of reasons to, to, to not decide the issue. Because the reason it's a dilemma is that if they actually do uh, tell the president, you can't do this, right? And as I say, you tell the president, you can't do this, and it does end up causing, undermining the war effort. You know, America's soldiers are, die because of the Supreme Court's intervention or something like that, right? Um, then that's gonna diminish respect for the court and it's gonna diminish respect for the constitution, 
the other alternative is that the Supreme Court actually writes a decision that sanctions constitutionally denying someone their civil liberties. Uh, and then Jackson's famous line is that it sits around like a loaded weapon, <laughs> waiting for someone else to use it in a time of crisis. Uh, so you don't want to actually constitutionally rationalize um, the uh, denial of civil liberties under the pretense of it's necessary for, uh, uh, for carrying out the war. So just avoid, it's a dilemma. Um, and he says, more than likely, the, the, the violation of civil liberties will only last uh, as long as the conflict lasts. Uh, so it'll go away, or maybe even earlier, may, may, maybe even once the military authorities recognize that the threat that they, that they that had justified the decision in the first place no, no longer exists. So, that, so that's his, his, uh, his position. The court just isn't in, in, in a good, uh, good place to, uh, to do this. As well, again, think about the court's capacity. How likely are, you know, look at the court, do they actually have the, um, the institutional knowledge for knowing what's uh, necessary and what's not necessary in the time of war? Um, Interesting. Yeah, most of them have never served, none of them now have served in the military. I think the last one was Justice Stevens. Uh, and he, I don't know what he did. He, he you know, had some so low, <laughs> he's a private or whatever, uh, during, during World War II, or he was in the Navy. Um, and it's not, so it's not like he had any you know, really high level experience uh, mm. dealing with uh, military strategy and what, what was you know, necessary in a conflict. Uh, so you know, what do they have to rely on? Well, some law clerks, right? <laughs> Who are you know, a year or two out of, <laughs> out of law school. Um, so I think there is a real question about whether or not the courts even have the requisite knowledge uh, to be able to decide what is or is not necessary, what the president's war powers should or should not look like. The place to look for that would be Congress. And I think con I think Congress can if it wants to. Uh, it's just, again, they, they, it's, it's difficult for members of Congress to act collectively in this way, but they, they do have the knowledge. Um, they have dedicated staff. They have committees de devoted to these questions. They've been working with the Pentagon on lots of things that uh, for, uh, you know, for, for, for years. So it's possible, but it, it's just difficult. It's difficult. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I would just add, I don't necessarily want you to walk away with a view that the president can just ignore the court in a time of war. <laughs> um, I, I think more what we're saying is there, there really hasn't been an example of the court making a major decision in a time of war where the president has had the choice about whether to follow it or to ignore it. Um, but I, I think that goes a lot to, to Josh's point that the court tends to stay out of the president's way in a time of war. They, they just don't tend to get involved. Um, that being said, you know, during Lincoln's presidency, uh, Lincoln made it a point to respond to every constitutional challenge to his authority. Um, he did it through letters, he did it through speeches, um, you know, so a number of those things were published in newspapers. Uh, you know, habeas corpus came up a lot, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation came up uh, quite frequently. And, you know, Lincoln didn't just leave these things as orders or directives that, that he had made. He laid out the constitutional case for why he was allowed to do these things. Right? Now, I'm not saying you're going to always agree with him. Um, you know, that you're going to read this stuff and go, okay, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. But I think it's significant that he made the effort, um, given that he was pretty busy while the war was going on. <laughs> and he, he could have made the decision to just ignore all of this and say, well, I'm the president, I do what I want. Um, no, he, uh, he did uh, try to make himself accountable to the American people um, and try to justify what he did. And then finally, just the who is the president accountable to? Well, you still do have the court of public opinion. You know, presidents still have to be accountable to the public. And, you know, that could conceivably give the president, you know, a good four years to prosecute a war uh, before he's subject to uh, re-election or, you know, the public being able to weigh in on, on what he's doing. Uh, 
uh, as part of war, but it still remains, you know, a, a fundamental check and you still have the impeachment power. Um, if the president is doing something that is beyond the bounds that Congress thinks he has uh, for his war power, they can impeach and remove him from office. Uh, so it's, it's not that the president is unlimited um, in the power that he has. Uh, you know, again, impeachment's a pretty big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, elections only come around four years. So these aren't the most effective checks um, on president's war power. Uh, but they still remain uh, anyway. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, it, it's um, it's it's kind of risky business for a president to ig ignore something from, coming from the courts because I, I mean, even if the um, even if the American public doesn't necessarily fully agree with the Supreme Court decision, it, it just sort of they still I think expect this kind of a kind of. Uh, reverence for the court, right? Maybe because we've been, we've heard that term so often throughout our history, right? That the Supreme Court ought to be treated with a kind of reverence, not to be blasphemous there, but, you know, um, but, it, but so it's, it, it, it looks risky. And, uh, you know, again, Jackson, it gets not, to, it's not that Jackson was necessarily issuing or ignoring, a, um, he was not ignoring, uh, you know, well, maybe he was. In, in the case of Jackson with the National Bank, he is he is being told that because uh, John Marshall ruled in 1819 that a, that a national bank is constitutional, then Andrew Jackson essentially has to sign the the the, the third bank bill, right? In uh, in 32, uh, or if or if Jackson tries to veto it, he can't veto it on grounds that it's unconstitutional. So what Jackson actually? So yeah, Jackson does ignore. The decision of the court that uh, in McCulloch v. Maryland that the, that a national bank is is um, is constitutional, but in that case you're right, Eric. Doesn't Jackson sort of say I'm going to you know I'm going to uh, you know do what my understanding of the Constitution says, and if the people disagree with me, they can vote me out of office in the upcoming election. Yeah. In fact, I think it was a strategy, wasn't it, by the Whigs to or by the uh, National Democrats to uh, to make that an election issue. Yeah, they did make an election issue. And yeah, you know, I, I don't know that by that point in American history, we had we had firmly reached the conclusion that only the court can interpret the Constitution. Um, you know, that's I, I think that view comes a little bit later, um, that it's sort uh -huh. of exclusively the court's role to interpret the Constitution. Even Marshall didn't actually say that in Marbury. You know, he said it was, you know, I forgot the exact language, but it's particularly the province of the court to interpret the Constitution. But he doesn't say only the court can interpret the Constitution. So I, I think Jackson is still operating under this, you know, this framework where, you know, the other branches can still weigh in on the constitutionality of laws. And we got to remember, um, most of the time, well, up to Jackson, when vetoes were issued by presidents, it was because they had dubious opinions about the constitutionality of laws. So they saw that as part of the executive function was to weed out constitutionality and use the veto power uh, to strike down laws that they you know, thought was unconstitutional, which is kind of like an executive power of judicial review. Um, so again, I, I think it, I think you have to go a little bit later before you get into that, you know, uh, this idea that the court is the exclusive arbiter, um, of what the constitution means, uh, that I, I don't know exactly when that sort of settles in, but I, I think that comes a little bit later. Maybe Josh Daniel, has an opinion on that. Yeah, Daniel Webster kind of says that in, uh, response to, uh, Jackson's, Jackson's veto, but... I don't think he goes all the way there. Douglas, Stephen Douglas, I think is the is the clearest and earliest example of someone who just gives a full throated defense of judicial supremacy, uh, where I, where it's like if if we start questioning the decisions of the Supreme Court, uh, that's it for the rule of law. <laughs> that was <big. laughs> that was basically his position. But Webster, kind of, he starts he starts moving then that in that direction. Um, which is interesting because it's kind of, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it comes towards the end of, you know, Marshall's tenure uh, on the Supreme So it shows you what the, the, the effect of Marshall's, uh, uh, of Marshall's tenure on the Supreme Court, what, what kind of effect it had that people are even kind of broaching that where you couldn't have imagined someone even, I, I think, um, 
really tiptoeing in that direction uh, earlier in the country's history. That's really fascinating. I hadn't thought of it, that, uh, thought of it uh, along those lines. That's really interesting. So we have a, a really great question from Casey I'd like to throw at you guys. Um, just to point out here, uh, I do wanna at some point before we wrap up, maybe ask you about what your thoughts are on the connection between the Curtis Wright and the Youngstown Steel case. And at the end of the webinar, I wanna ask you guys your, uh, you know, your thoughts on maybe some the relationship between particular presidents and, and uh, maybe Supreme Court justices or just, uh, yeah, Supreme Court justices. But, but here's, I think this is an interesting question from Casey. Uh, do the precedent set in cases uh, such as Shank and Debs, and you, you guys have talked about Korematsu, but do those have peacetime implications with regards to limitations on civil liberties? And I would add with regard to limitations on executive power. So again, they're you know wartime uh, cases, but um, so do they carry over into peacetime. Um, maybe maybe Shink maybe the did. question. Is, uh, ahead, yeah, so Shink with with the clear and present danger test, uh, you, you did have that applied in a few, in a few cases. I think the most famous one would be Dennis versus United States. Uh, where the Supreme Court said that it was fine to uh, to say that communists couldn't um, teach uh, about communism, essentially. Uh, and that was an application of the clear and present danger test, but a revised version of the clear and present danger test. Uh, but then, then they really do uh, replace the clear and present danger test with uh, the Brandenburg test, uh, incitement to imminent lawless action. So for a while, you would say that clear and present danger test did have some did have some force. The Korematsu decision, um, no, I don't think that I can't recall of an instance because it became pretty. Yeah, it, it was uh, came to view very be, be viewed very poorly, very quickly, and so I don't think the Supreme Court uh, ever really relied on it after after that uh, after it was decided. Um, Debs, I don't know. Um, but maybe Eric knows of a case, but it, sometimes it just depends on, well, I think Korematsu is a good example. To what extent is the, is the country willing to accept um, the, uh, the, the nature of, uh, of the court's reasoning? And obviously with Korematsu, that was gonna be a diff more difficult one to, to actually point to and say, oh yes, we're basing this uh, just, on, uh, just on Korematsu. Although the, you might've had some justices reference it like, oh, well, we do know that in, in times of crisis, things are maybe a little bit different, um, but I don't know of a case where it was actually grounded just in Korematsu. So I don't think we've seen similar circumstances, really. And I don't right, know that, right. hopefully we don't yeah. ever, but you never know. Um, sorry, Eric, I didn't mean to cut you off if you were gonna jump in. No, you didn't. Um, oh. I, I just, uh, I, same way, I don't know any cases that cite Korematsu as a, as a precedent for allowing similar types of <laughs> internments yeah. or, uh, any anything like that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think if if there's a good thing about these cases, they are pretty limited to times of war. Uh, they don't seem to really be able to bleed out uh, into uh, the the peace. Uh, and so the court has, I, I think, actually done a pretty good job um, keeping them contained um, and not letting them become broad uh, threats to civil liberties uh, in general. Um, and, you know, that probably speaks to the court realizing, you know, the, the impact these cases could have uh, and, and what kind of threats they could have to fundamental rights um, that they have uh, sort of treated them uh, in a way that's, that's kept them contained. Yeah, that's great. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, can we just say something about uh, um, the importance of the, of the Curtis Wright cases and the... Um, Youngstown cases. I mean, both. I mean, are those wartime cases? I mean, they're they're foreign policy cases, but and both both involve, I think, industry, right? Uh, the government's uh, executive executive orders involving regulation of, of industries to a certain extent. What do you what do we take away from those cases? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> <Don't take> your, <laughs> maybe that's maybe the broad that's too broad of a question. Maybe right. it's too much to do in four minutes. But 
Uh, where does the court come down in those in those uh, opinions or, or in those cases with regard to executive foreign policy powers? And so the the young the the Youngstown case, um, I think, is probably the one that's cited most, and in particularly Justice Jackson's concurring opinion. Uh, in that case, he kind of outlines these three levels of uh, presidential power. Um, I my, I'm of the opinion though that his framework is not really that helpful, uh, um, even though it's even though it's cited uh, quite commonly. I think it's cited partly because Jackson was just a good writer. Um, and so they, his, it sounds nice, um, but <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't okay. actually give you, I mean, it really doesn't help you decide, uh, you know, uh, other, other issues. So the Youngstown case, um, the other thing that's, I think, in the background there is also the politics, which is that uh, Truman actually, um, he had the authority to do what he did under statute, uh, at least for a short time. Uh, but the problem was that the authority that he had uh, was opposed by uh, unions, uh, the statutory authority that he had. And so he wasn't willing to rely on that statutory authority. So he tried to rest it just on his inherent uh, authority as, as president. And so I actually think that that had a good deal to do with the Supreme Court's decision as well. Like if he had, if he had chosen a different route, he could have avoided the constitutional conflict uh, or, the constitu uh, or the constitutional cri crisis, but he didn't want to anger a key constituency uh, of his. And so he didn't do that. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, I, I've always said Curtis Wright is the high watermark of the presidency, um, at least oh. from the interpretation of the court. Huh. Um, because, you know, in that case, the, the court, the court, you know, of course, says the, uh, the proclamation is constitutional. But I think what's implied in that case is that the president didn't even need the joint resolution by Congress. He could have done it on his own anyway. You know, if he wanted an embargo, he could have just declared one, <laughs> you know, that that power was inherent um, in, in the power of the presidency, which, you know, is, is a very expansive understanding of executive power under the Constitution. Um, and this is a this is arguably you know, a huge win for the presidency uh, overall. Again, it's, you know, foreign policy again. Uh, where we know the president has greater discretion and, and greater power overall. But just in general, um, I think it, it weighs very heavily on the side of, uh, of the president doing those things. Um, Youngstown, yeah, I mean, it's such a messy case. I mean, I, don't all nine justices write an opinion or something like that in it? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah. crazy. Um, yeah, Jackson is the one that most of us remember from the case. And, and as Josh said, he's got this three-part scheme, you know, which I'll oversimplify as saying, you know, when the president acts pursuant to an act of Congress, you know, he's at the utmost of his presidential power, and that's fully constitutional. And then you've got the president acting in the absence of an act of Congress. And so this is where his power is a little more dubious, and we have to look with a greater degree of scrutiny. And then you have the president acting against an act of Congress. Um, and, you know, in that instance, you know, we have to employ our highest scrutiny uh, because his use of power is very suspect. My issue with that is that this is divining executive power with respect to Congress, which is not what the Constitution says. <laughs> executive power is supposed to be defined by the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. That's, that's kind of what an enumerated document does. Um, and, you know, I, I think the I think the view from Congress is that this is likely to have the effect of restraining executive power uh, more, but I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, because at least since Youngstown, we've seen more and more delegation of legislative power to the executive branch. Um, the court has a whole separate you know, group of cases dealing with the, the delegation doctrine. 
um, and you know, Congress giving power to uh, you know commissions and regulatory agencies and all these things you know associated with the executive branch. Um, so I'm I'm not entirely convinced that this really had the effect of reining in executive power. I I think this is actually something um, that, given the popularity of the presidency and the focal point of the presidency in American government today. Uh, stands a very good chance of Congress feeding the presidency more authority and more power um, than the Constitution would. And we perhaps would be better off thinking of the president in terms of constitutional authority uh, rather than legislative authority. Now, I might be wrong about that, but um, uh, that's, <laughs> that that's been my view on it. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. So, uh, very thoughtful. And we have about uh, two or three, four minutes left. So I just, I want to shift gears. So a little bit here at the end on the, on a more personal level, any particularly um, sort of friendly or contentious relationships between a president and a Supreme court justice that you that sort of come to mind among your favorites. <laughs> wow. Times when it just got ugly. Yeah, well, maybe I mean, they were a little too buddy buddy. Well, obviously, Roosevelt and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse um, is always a good oh, one. Oh yeah, because that's right. Just they the, because they were labeled the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's pretty evocative. Um, so that's. A, did, do you know? Did Roosevelt was that Roosevelt's camp? That did I don't know if he or? actually no. said that, or, or if it was just, uh, uh, or just kind of defenders of the New Deal started to oh. call them. Started to call them that. Interesting. Um, I mean, I'll mention one more recently that I think is uh, that I think is interesting. It had, it, it's that in in the future we'll know more about this. I, I think that's the case, and that's the relationship between President Obama and Chief Justice Roberts. Um, because I think that there uh, the there's a lot of uh, people. So people who work in uh, the, the kind of legal world in Washington D.C. have indicated that there was. Uh, substantial backdoor communication between uh, President Obama and, and Chief Justice Roberts, particularly when it came to uh, NFIB versus Sebelius when the court was deciding the uh, Obamacare, the Afford uh, Affordable Care Act. And I don't know that you would necessarily call it contentious, but it was clear that uh, President Obama really did not want the Supreme Court to strike down the centerpiece of his uh, uh, First term in office, uh, legislative, uh, and so the again, I think that we'll 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 see in the future that there was, you know, an, an attempt to um, put pressure on Chief Justice Roberts uh, to uh, to try to influence him in in some way, com coming coming from you know coming from the president. So, uh, of course, I, the, the final one I would guess would be. And may, actually, maybe I would say my favorite would be the relationship between Jefferson and Marshall, uh, simply because they just hated each other uh, so much. Um, they just really just, <laughs> and they were cousins. And I think someone said of, of, of Marshall, one of Marshall's uh, friends after he died said that he had no faults at all. <laughs> he had no faults at all, his own, except for one, which is that he could see nothing good in his cousin. Uh, and he was referring oh. to Jefferson. Uh, that is his loathing of Jefferson was so comprehensive that he couldn't even see a single thing that was good about him, uh, which he thought was the supporter of Marshall thought was taking things a little bit too far. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I would have to throw out uh, Justice Tawney and James Buchanan um, as mm. a, another interesting relationship. Um, mm. Lincoln, of course, accused them of being two linchpins in a conspiracy to spread slavery uh, throughout the Union. Uh, we know that they did have a fairly close relationship, and Tawney was frequently at the White House. Um, what they talked about, you know, is a matter of speculation, uh, but... Uh, there is uh, there is a strong sense that Buchanan, you know, may have helped craft the strategy um, that Tawney was going to use in Dred Scott, uh, and certainly gave him reassurance that that opinion would be would be enforced um, and and carried forward. Uh, so you know you you of course don't have what are known as advisory opinions from the the Supreme Court, but. 
it isn't uncommon for an individual justice to have a relationship with the president or to be relied upon to give advice or, you know, to offer up suggestions or, or those kinds of things, especially if they have a friendly relationship with them. Um, but uh, in, in that instance, that might have uh, gone over to the level of collaboration <laughs> between the two. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I have to admit, I've always found the relationship between those two men fascinating. Yeah, another great example. By the way, just one last quick thought that you remind me, Eric, did, was there wasn't there pressure from Buchanan or from the White House to uh, have two justices um, not not take part in the Dred Scott decision? Yes. Right, so that's interesting. Yes. So they're going the other way, that's really interesting. Okay. Well, on that note, gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, this has just been absolutely fantastic. I've said this before and I mean it every time though. I've just learned so much from you guys. Um, and he, uh, he says, thanks again for getting up and doing this. He calls you saints and scholars. Uh, I don't know if I'd go that far, but, uh, but, but scholars certainly, and no, I'm just joking. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate your thoughts and, and, and uh, you guys are the best. Really appreciate it. So have a great weekend. Josh, good luck with all the internet stuff at home. Oh, thanks. My yeah. need to replace my router apparently. Ah, uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, one of the most uh, things I'd least like to do is yeah. deal with technology. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. All right. And have a great weekend. All right, take care. Good to see you, thanks Josh. You. Good to see you. And thanks to everybody else joining us today. Um, great questions, as always. Just a reminder about the email that you'll receive with your link for a certificate of participation. If you've enjoyed our webinar today or have been enjoying the webinars this semester, look into the other resources that are provided at tah.org by Ashbrook. Um, we have other webinar series, we have documents available, we have um, uh, all sorts of resources, including uh, more opportunities for in-person seminars as part of our Rediscovering America uh, program. So keep an eye out for those things and try to take advantage of them um, if you're so inclined. Please spread the word about what we do, including these webinars um, with your friends, your colleagues on social media. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Our next webinar will be on Saturday, December 4th, and we will be discussing the modern presidency. So just building on some of the things that these two fine scholars uh, were talking about today. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Until then, take care. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free programs, resources, and documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.